Hi everybody, it's Hyena Gore, and today I'd like to talk to you about another historical figure, and that is Grigory Rasputin. I'm absolutely fascinated with history, particularly Russian history, so of course there was no way that I was going to pass up the opportunity to talk about this man in particular. He's such a fascinating individual, honestly. Now, you've already seen what I'm drawing in action. I've never really animated before and I'm trying to get the hang of it, so I'll be talking about this whilst animating my title screen for the channel. It's a bit mindless, but I hope you enjoy it nonetheless. So, Grigory Rasputin was born on the 22nd of January, which in the Russian calendar was the 10th, as the Russians used a different calendar to our Gregorian one. And he was born in 1869 in a place called Pokrovskoy in Siberia. I don't know how to say that, sorry. <laughs> Um, he was born into the peasantry and thus his life was really hard as it was for most peasants. Um, Russia was an agrarian monarchy by that point, meaning that they hadn't really begun industrializing like the other European nations had been. They still had serfs and peasants, which whilst not entirely unusual, was becoming more and more um, strange and unheard of in European culture, especially uh, the serfs. Poor people definitely existed, and they still do, especially in capitalist society, but the whole classification of serfdom was something that was very medieval almost. Rasputin was illiterate, though he went to school, and he was to an extent illiterate for most of his life. He was actually born as Grigory Novik, and Rasputin was actually a nickname for him, meaning debauched one due to his licentious nature towards women. He was a bit of a hornbag as a teenager, and definitely as an adult, and people knew about it. He converted to Christianity and was introduced to this sect of the Russian Orthodox religion called the Flagellant Sect. The Flagellants believed that one was nearest to God when they were feeling holy passionlessness, which of course Rasputin twisted into meaning that you were nearest to God after orgasm and sexual exhaustion. <laughs> he might have been onto something, but he was also insane, so he didn't become a monk. I wonder why. At 19 years old, he married and had four children, but he was very unsatisfied, so he left his family and began to travel. You see pictures of him, and he's just this scary-looking middle-aged dude, covered in hair and with freaky eyes. Um, but yeah, he was once apparently a child, um, which is weird. So of course this horny teenage boy isn't going to want to settle, um, and he began travelling and went to Greece and Jerusalem, and he made quite a reputation for himself. He was a self-proclaimed holy man with the alleged ability to heal the sick and predict the future, which apparently no one really second-guessed. After wandering for years, he made his way back to Russia in 1903 and was welcomed into the courts of St. Petersburg quite warmly as many of the elite were dabbling in the occult and mysticism and found this absolutely deranged looking man fascinating. <laughs> he was confident and definitely knew how to command and control a room, so despite the fact that he might have been visually off-putting and apparently really smelly uh, from all the info that we have on him, um, I'm really not that surprised that he became so popular. He was just this enigma of a man. The attention that he drew eventually wound up attracting the monarchy of Russia, the Romanovs, and in 1908, he was introduced to them. Alexander Romanov, the German wife of Tsar Nicholas, was absolutely desperate because her younger son, Alexei, I think, was a haemophiliac and kept having bleeding episodes. Haemophilia is actually really common amongst members of the monarchy and is unsurprisingly linked to inbreeding. Side tangent, just because I'm obsessed with this game, um, but that's actually what the theory is for Lady Domitrescu in the Resident Evil 8 game. Um, that pre-mega my seat she had implanted um that she had haemophilia and that was what they were trying to cure i don't know i just think that's cool that they've added that in as a little historical fact but anyway back to the wizard man so rasputin actually succeeded in easing the suffering of alexi no one knew how he did it there is a main theory that i'll get to in a second but the royal family was like absolutely astonished and he saw this opportunity to exploit the situation in a very parasite-esque sort of way and warned Alexandra and Nicholas that Alexei's destiny was now irrevocably and forever tied to Rasputin and that he would have to be his physician from now on. The royals agreed because they're idiots and Rasputin was able in that moment to take one of the most prestigious seats of power in all of Russia. Rasputin greatly enjoyed the power that came with being in the court of the Tsar and Tsarina. 
To Nicholas and Alexander, Rasputin played the part of a pious and humble holy man, but outside their eyes, he fell back into his perverted ways, taking mistresses and claiming that having physical contact with him would cure them of their illnesses and mental burdens. Yeah, so he said he had magic genital. Whenever someone tried to tell Nicholas that his court physician was an absolute weirdo, Nicholas would just like banish them to some really remote part of Russia and remove any influence that they might have had. So Rasputin had the complete protection of the court and he relished it. He actually did get removed from court one time, though, in 1911, after getting into this really big scandal. Nicholas had kind of had enough, but he was forced to reinstate him as Alexandra contested this decision heavily and Alexei started to suffer without Rasputin by his side. It's actually believed that um, his doctors had prescribed Alexei aspirin, which is really bad for people with haemophilia. Uh, as it can contribute to bleeding episodes. So the main working theory is that Rasputin just stopped giving him aspirin and also treated him with oak bark, I believe, which is folk medicine that's used to this day. Um, and monarchs are just dumb anyway, and they didn't pick up on this. Nicholas was just like, I pretend I do not see it and ignored any other allegations because of this. Now I'm gonna make another video on this because the political climate of 1900s Russia leading up to the assassination of the royal family is something I'm really interested in. But basically the faith in the royal family was severely, severely waning. And Nicholas actually went out to the front lines during World War I to assist and take command of his troops. And in his absence, Alexandra assumed power as the empress temporarily with Rasputin as her advisor. So there are a lot of theories and rumors that perhaps Alexandra was sleeping with Rasputin as to others, it seemed like they were really close and they were, but there's actually no substantial evidence that they were having an affair. And this was more of a rumor of misogyny. Um, I'm not a monarchy lover at all. And that revolution that occurs not long after all these events is one I adore learning about because I totally agree with doing that particular thing that I cannot name to royals. But some of the rumours spread about Alexandra as well as other elite women in history such as Lucretia Borgia, who I will talk about also in another video, are just so vile because they are simply attacks on the fact that they were women, not on the fact that they were awful and evil since those rumours wouldn't be spread about their husbands. <laughs> But anyway, Rasputin really did enjoy whispering Alexandra's ear when it came to political decisions. And his influence extended to appointing church officials, to selecting cabinet members who were often incompetent, and also intervening mildly in military affairs, which, yeah, was a bit crazy. Um, he didn't throw his weight behind any political group, but he strongly opposed anyone who went against the autocracy and especially himself. <laughs> and a lot of people did not like him. It got to the point where, just like the song says, the court got absolutely sick of this lunatic roaming around the Winter Palace and multiple assassination attempts were made on him. None of them were successful, which further added to rumours that perhaps Rasputin was a mortal, which only gained more traction after his death. It was only in 1916 a few weeks before the the revolution occurred that an assassination attempt was actually successful. This was done by the husband of the Tsar's niece, Prince Felix Yusupov, Vladimir Purushkovic, a member of the political elite known as the Duma, and the Tsar's cousin, Grand Duke Dmitry Pavolik Pavolovic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, they finally executed a conspiracy to eliminate Rasputin once and for all. On the 29th of December, or the 16th in the old calendar, Rasputin was invited to Yusupov's home. Um, and this night is legendary. This night truly is a legend in and of itself. It inspired the Boney M song, led to rumors that he couldn't die. Um, and he's just a madman, to be honest. So the legend is, they had poisoned his wine and food and he didn't die. Obviously sending them into a panic, Yusupov shot Rasputin, but this didn't kill him either. And then he ran out into the courtyard and then they clubbed him and that didn't kill him either. And then he was only able to die when they tied him up and threw him into a river where he drowned. The autopsy of Rasputin actually shows that he died from being shot point blank in the forehead, but you know, they didn't want to admit that they were absolutely incompetent and bad at killing someone. So they made up this huge giant tale of how hard it was to kill him and that he's the antichrist and all this stuff. The rumors that he ran away um, and couldn't die would have been really hard <laughs> to prove, however, because allegedly, and I say allegedly, 
we have a particular body part of his preserved. And he would have died a horrendous death without it. Or if he was still alive, he wouldn't be living his best poor life. Because apparently we have his member preserved and God, it is a sight. It's horrible as most things that are preserved are, but it's just the idea that they had to preserve Rasputin's legendary peen. Honestly, I, I think you'd really appreciate that, to be honest. There's uh, been multiple people claim that they have Rasputin's Schwang. One was a dehydrated sea cucumber, and the one that I saw is in a Russian erotic museum. Honestly, most people don't think it's that, and that it's some sort of animals, and they're probably right, but it is really funny to think that that's what we've got of him. So that's Rasputin. A horrendously weird and licentious man who paraded his debauchery around without a care in the world. He was a charlatan and a deceiver, but absolutely one of my favourite people to learn about. What a timeline it is that I am alive on the same planet that Rasputin once lived on. So if you have anything you'd like me to talk about, drop it in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.